Hi, this is Gary Collins and Heath Squire of The Primal Show, and today we have guest Dr. Leon Cheng, and what makes Leon new, unique is he is obviously an MD, but he owns a CrossFit, and he lives a primal lifestyle, and so does his wife, who is also a doctor as well, a PhD. So what we'd like to talk about today is how you kind of found the lifestyle and how you got involved in CrossFit and primal and paleo. Sure. Uh, thanks for having me. Yeah. Um, to start with how we got into CrossFit, uh, one of my colleagues, her husband was actually a trainer at 24 Hour Fitness. Uh, I think he was a manager at one of the local branches, and he sort of found CrossFit. Uh, at the time, both Alessandra and myself were maybe 15, 20 pounds overweight, uh, weren't really doing much physically, and both of us have always been active uh, early in our life. So we were just looking for something. Those stars kind of aligned. We got introduced to each other, and he started training both of us just around the park using some of the CrossFit methodology. And then secondarily, he had kind of a protege at 24-Hour Fitness, uh, Paul Estrada, who's now my business partner with CrossFit Elysium, and showed Paul CrossFit. Paul got into CrossFit that way. And then when this guy moved to Boston, introduced Paul and I to each other, said, you know, you guys are both kind of doing the same thing, thought maybe you'd like to, you know, just have a training partner to work out with. So after this guy, Steve, moved, Paul and I were training together literally in our garage, you know, kind of the way you're supposed to do, start off with CrossFit, you know, the classic garage gym. And he was bringing over some of his personal clients to train with us after we got, you know, some of the basic equipment set up. So at our height, we had maybe three, four people, three, four clients of his, in addition to us, all working out at the same time in my garage. That went on for a couple of months. The neighbors were kind of interested in what we were doing. And then finally we decided, you know, as we learned more, you know what, we might as well just go for it. We might as well just open up our own place. You know, both of us love this. He, you know, his career was always going to be in personal training and coaching. And it had definitely become a passion of mine by that point. So we decided to just, uh, just go for it. And luckily we've been able to, you know, have success. Well, and you opened it pretty early on. I mean, this was before the big boom. I mean, you guys were around before, you know, what, there's almost, what, 6,000 worldwide now? I may have my numbers wrong. Oh, yeah, we're, I, I think, actually, we crossed, uh, CrossFit HQ crossed the 10,000 affiliate mark. Oh, wow, gosh. Very recently. That's so, massive. yeah, we were one of the first. It, it, it's kind of funny when you look back on it now because when we opened up, you know, we thought, obviously, you know, we're the newest. We look at the list of established names that were already present and we thought you know hey look at how many guys there are that are already in business and now when you look at the list and you realize hey we're one of the old school people it's yeah. it's kind of cool to think of it that way <laughs> um so to answer your second question about how uh, you know my wife and i kind of got into more of the paleo primal lifestyle i think for us that was just a natural evolution of being drawn into a healthier lifestyle that we that one will be if you stick with CrossFit or any sort of effective exercise program. You know, we were looking for ways to make our workouts better, ways to improve our lives outside of the gym. And then almost by accident, we stumbled onto first the principles of paleo and then secondarily the principles of a primal lifestyle. You know, the way so much of this works, and I think you guys can probably attest to this as well, you can't look to the established scientific community for a definitive answer and say, okay, well, that's what I have to do. I know that will work. Nothing else will work. You just sort of have to try it yourself. And that's what we yeah. did. So we, we, we said, you know, the basic rationale for this makes sense. The science behind paleo and primal, it does make sense. Let's go for it. And then we saw every bit of positive change that we were looking for, you know, lost unnecessary fat, got healthier, you know, it just worked. So, yeah. We're, Isn't we're it amazing out. how that is? How, uh, you know, because there's a lot of, I, I know Heath gets hit with this too, but I get a lot of emails saying, where's your data? Where's your data? Show me how this works. And it's like, I, I go, proof's in the pudding. I'm a, I'm a realist. You know, if, if it doesn't work, I'll know because it won't work for me and it won't work for a bunch of other people. And that's kind of the touchy situation right now is they're just starting to do some of the research on the paleo diet get more uh, far as more in depth, but it's more of a common sense movement is what I tell people. You know, if you really think about how the human body is meant to function, what it's meant to eat, it kind of makes sense. It just all falls together. 
and getting all this empirical data and having these massive studies, you know, it's like that's what the people with the science backgrounds do is they just hammer you one after another. And it's like, you know, what? you know, what? I just and the people who hammer you, it, the hard part is they're the ones out of shape. <laughs> exactly. And they're the ones telling you, well, I don't get it. I, I, this doesn't work. And I'm all you're overweight and you're telling the skinny, get in shape, healthy guy that it doesn't work. Right. It's a battle. Exactly. You know, we we. We always tell our members that, you know, it's sort of a two, it's a two part answer to that sort of questioning. And, you know, the first part is one, well, actually, the established scientific community and that data that supports, you know, your traditional high carb, low fat diet, as an example, that data is flawed too, you know, and one of the things that I always point them to is Gary Taubes is, you know, good synopsis article, you know, the, the soft science of dietary fat, which, you know, is a good lead in to show them just how, corrupt and erroneous basically our, our basic health recommendations where that information information is based from based on it's just wrong to start and that's the first thing i tell them and then the second part is exactly what you said you know what you've spent decades eating a certain way living a certain way and you're not happy with the way you are or with the way you look try it give it a try for a month two months even if it's the worst thing on the planet you're not going to cure yourself in a month or two months. You know, you could smoke cigarettes, as an example, continuously for two months. At the end of the day, you're probably still going to be alive. So it can't be that bad. Give it a try. See what yeah. happens, right? But I think a lot of people, they kind of want to use it as an excuse. Yeah. You need to show me all the data first before I'll even contemplate making a change. And they know you can't do that. So there's their excuse to not make the change in the first place. It's, it's, it's a little disheartening at times. Have, have you... Uh... Can you describe maybe the sensation from becoming maybe like a carb and starch burner now that you're a fat burner and maybe the uh, effect that, you know, like the anti-inflammation effect of eating like a paleo type of diet has had uh, on yourself? Um, where, you know, so many people, have, they think they have to rely on, you know, carving up before they do a really high intensity, you know, workout. Can you kind of talk to that a little bit? Oh, absolutely. So, you know, I think a lot of it is based a lot of it is based on how I felt in retrospect, right? And I think we all, for example, not even related to workouts, but I think we all remember back in the day that post-lunch feeling of just just tiredness or, you know, after you would eat your traditional meal, uh, lunch or dinner, and then immediately you feel like you're in a food coma. And it's like, well, that's because you just ate a plate full of pasta or whatever it happens to be. And, you know, I know that was a daily occurrence for me. That doesn't happen anymore. To get more to the side of what you're saying, yes, there. When I first started doing CrossFit, and we actually were continuing to eat more high carb, you know, a lot of gluten, uh, rice, and pasta and whatnot, I would be sore for days <laughs> after workouts. Yeah. Um, you know, and some of it obviously is to be expected by nature of the workout, but eventually you would expect your body to kind of attenuate itself to that. And you know, now that we've kind of gone more the low carb primal route, that soreness really doesn't exist. You know, every once in a while after a particularly strenuous workout, maybe, but overall general levels of soreness, especially after a high intensity workout, they're definitely less. And that, you know, I got, I know it's multifactorial, but I have to think some element of that decreased soreness is just due to decreased whole body inflammation as a whole. And you know, the, the, the final thing that I was going to say is I've basically, I've worn glasses since I was five. And my prescription has essentially been one unbroken string of needing a new prescription every six months or a year. You know, my eyesight has just gotten continually worse. And when that, the only time that has stopped in my life was when we started, when we adopted a paleo primal diet. Uh, I went to the ophthalmologist a year afterwards. They did a checkup. If anything, my vision actually got slightly better. So, wow. Wow. And, and I have not needed a new prescription since then. You know, I think that was maybe three or four years ago. So, you know, to me, that's one of the single most important things that's happened. You know, my eyes have literally not gotten worse. Do I know the exact reason? No. Is it correlated in time with when we started eating healthier? And can I envision maybe less microinflammation in the blood vessels of my eyes? Obviously. Yes. So. It's probably, I mean, you got to think about the foods you're now consuming are 
the majority of them are all anti-inflammatory. So you have less digestive stress. You know, your body, your joints have less, you know, inflammation. It's got to carry on to probably all parts of your body. So actually, you know, we know it does. So it makes sense, you know, what you're saying. And it's, have you noticed, so you're saying by following like a low carb, low sugar kind of uh, paleo slash primal being, um, you know, grass fed dairy or trying to, you know, or consuming organic dairy, you're saying that you've really seen a massive reduction in inflammation. So you're able to now work out longer. You know, you're, you're, you have less joint pain. Um, I mean, there's something to be said. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I would definitely say so. Yeah. And have, have, do you notice a difference with like sustained energy through your workouts or throughout your day, actually, um, kind of keeping your blood sugar in check and how important is that to you? Do you, you know, do you pay attention to that throughout the day? Um, so I don't actually, you know, I don't do anything as data driven as check my own blood sugar or anything uh, throughout the day, but I can definitely tell you, I feel like I certainly have more sustained energy throughout the day and I'm actually currently kind of experimenting on myself, if you want to call it that. So I, I've been focusing on exclusively Olympic weightlifting now for quite some time. And over the last few months, I've actually been trying to move down a weight class. So for me, I've really had to watch what I've eaten and even to, this, to the point of portion control sure. at this point as well. But before, portion control never really entered our, lot, our, you know, our mindset. We knew that if we just ate clean, kept it to the principles that we needed to, all else would, you know, everything else would pretty much take care of itself. And that was true for me. I was able to live at my weight class without any issue. Now that I'm trying to move down a weight class, I'm having to sort of shift myself metabolically. And that is the time where I would suspect I would feel it. To be perfectly honest with you, I expected to walk around tired throughout the day, not feel like I had much energy in these efforts to move down a weight class. And that hasn't happened. You know, to be honest with you, I feel, I feel good. I've lost... 13 pounds in a month and a half simply by taking it from an 80 20 approach to maybe a 95 5 approach now so you know it works and if you were to describe your your plate in terms of carbs proteins you know overall calories i mean how how have you been able to reduce you know your weight are you focusing on reducing calories or are you upping your protein and or upping your fat you know what does it uh, look like? <laughs> so in general, it's been a reduction in calories and um, better attempts to eat clean. So for example, before uh, I would eat ad lib until I felt full. And that typically would be a giant heaping plate of whatever I was eating. Generally, that's going to be an entire steak, maybe say 16 ounce steak. And the other half of the plate would be vegetables. Uh Two to three times a week, I was eating rice or a sweet potato or something like that, even French fries, uh, to sort of supplement the carbohydrate intake. Now that rice is carefully titrated. I might eat a cup after training, only on training days. Non-training days, I don't eat any sort of starchy carbohydrate at all. And as far as the portion control, I'm not weighing and measuring. I'm not counting the calories. But I'm pretty good at eyeballing. So now it might be three quarters of that steak. It might be half a plate of vegetables. And the overall amount, I would say, has been cut down by about a half to a third every meal. Wow. That, okay. That's, yeah, that's interesting. That's yeah. awesome. Gary and I have talked a lot about yeah. not consuming too many calories or more calories than your body can metabolize. And if you do, you're going to end up increasing your weight size. So what you're saying is you're able to keep up your strength reduce your overall calories, have sustained energy, and, uh, and you've been able to you know, follow a, a lower carb approach here. I mean, that's pretty impressive. And you're doing Olympic you know, weightlifting, so. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> fair. Yeah. To be fair, my, my strength has mostly been maintained. This is what I've been telling people. Sure. I have lost, you know, I can feel it on the heavy back squats, uh, the heavy front squats, for example. I'm certainly not as strong as when I was heavier. But it's mostly there, and I'll tell you what, you know, I've been messing around with some of my gymnastic stuff, for example. I can almost pull off, you know, a front lever. It's been kind of a goal of mine since I started this five years ago, and I, and I can feel it there. My body weight strength has gone through the roof. So, and, you know, I'm leaner. I look better. So, overall, I'm Yeah. Well, and it's, it's an evolution, and, I, and that's why I always tell people that 
everyone jumps into this and they want instant results and they want you know the 30 day transformation and I'd say yeah you can have a pretty big transformation in a short period of time but even with me I mean I went through a phase like you uh, and what I did is I basically didn't change the amount of my plate the content of the food had changed but not the portion size. I didn't change that. I kept eating the standard because we're it's ingrained in us for so long. You know, you've been eating the same way for so long that you kind of keep the same ratios. Well, what I noticed was as time went on and my body adjusted, it took quite a while. I mean, we're talking years of experimenting and going, is eventually my body settled in and it finally said, you know what? You don't need to eat this much. And I was kind of scared because I knew I had like five, seven pounds that I just didn't want, but I didn't want to have to go to any extremes to get rid of it like I had done in the past doing the yo-yo. So right. I thought it was interesting once I did that and I actually got everything balanced correctly and I ate in tune with my body, which was only when I was hungry. You know, and that takes a while. It takes a long time for all your hormones to kind of hit homeostasis to where you actually don't eat off all these other cues. You know, visual cues, time cues, there's so much going on, social cues. And so when I did that, I would say I eat half of what I ate before. And nothing changed except for I got skinnier or leaner. Now, I shouldn't say skinnier. I, I lost a little bit of muscle mass, not much, but that's natural. Because the heavier you are, the more fat you have, you have to have more muscle in order to maintain proper balance in your body as far as keeping all your structures you know, in line, the way they're meant to be. So naturally, the fatter you are, the more muscle you have. You know, it depending. And there's a whole <laughs> lots of philosophies behind that, but just to say. And it was interesting how lean I got, but I did notice a little dip in strength, but not what I expected. Yeah, pretty amazing how that all works, how your body just kind of finds itself, but it takes a long time. And I think that's the biggest, biggest thing to take out of this is people want to rush everything. You know, you're talking three, four years with you. I don't think it was much different for me. I think it was three, four, five years before I went through this whole thing to where all of a sudden I went, oh, wow, I don't have to eat as much. Right. You yeah. know, your, your comment about the time that it takes, it's totally true. You know, one of our, you know, we call her our rock star member. Uh, her name is Irene Mechia, for example. She's lost basically 200 pounds in wow. – you know, just a few years. Uh, some of it was on her own before joining us. The vast majority of it was after she became a member, and she's still been going strong. But what I tell her, because she does hit those plateaus as well, right? She hits. She's even had regression. Yeah. And I try to remind her, you know, it took you decades to put this weight on. And during those decades, you taught your body one way to eat, one way to live. Your hormones are reacting in a certain way. You have set your homeostasis up. To be a certain way, it's not going to undo itself in a month or a year yeah. or even a couple of years. You know, this yep. is going to be a stepwise progression. And, you know, the hopefully that's advice that will sustain her, right? Because it, it's not an easy, smooth, unbroken process. Yeah, it's well, not only like that, but you get – me and Heath get a ton of questions on macros and saying I, – I got one the other day and said, hey, how many carbs should I be eating? And I was like, hey, I don't even know how to answer that. You know, because I'm all, everyone's different. I don't know where you're at. I don't know what your weight's at. I don't know your activity levels. I went, it's, a, it's a whole chain of things, and it's different. It's so individual that I'm like, what I eat carb-wise may not necessarily work for you. Right. You ask me a 10-variable equation, yeah, and you gave me simple. one variable. Right, yeah. But, you know, you have people that need to lose weight, you know, wherever they are. And I think following a keto-paleo kind of approach works for Pretty much anybody because you're turning your body into a fat burning machine and you're getting rid of the starch and the sugar as your primary source of energy and you're turning it into fat. And then for myself personally, I follow like a 60, 30, 10. So you have 60% protein, 30% fat, and 10% from vegetables. I really don't – I don't eat any grains at all. And I, I have the most amount of energy kind of taking in about 50 grams of protein per meal. I usually mix it with some sort of fiber. So it's a slow, slow kind of burning through my system. And I have those sustained energy levels all day long. I feel great. I don't have any crashes. And I'm extremely strict. I don't – I don't cheat, and if I do cheat, it's like with dark chocolate that's sweetened with stevia, you know. So, and I, I found ways to be able to cheat, but not really, you know. And um, but 
have you played around with your macros at all in terms of trying to increase your strength levels maybe in the areas where you're weak and consuming either more protein or more fat but still not taking in an overabundance of calories so you're you know that myself personally I found I, I'm able to gain strength by increasing that protein and fiber and mixing it with fat have you played around with that at all uh, you know I have so I actually had made an attempt about a year ago to move down a weight class, you know, same thing I'm currently doing, but I kind of went about it in a slightly different way. Uh, that attempt, what I did was go totally clean. I essentially edited out every form of carbohydrate if it wasn't a vegetable. You know, I don't typically eat fruit myself, so, you know, my sole carbohydrate consumption was coming from vegetables during this phase. And in that phase, I did lean out. That you know, there's no question I lean out, but my strength took a nosedive. So if I had to look from a macro consumption component, yeah. that was probably 50 protein, 45 fat, and maybe 5% carb, if that, okay. right? And I, the, you know, the proof is in the pudding. As, as you said, Gary, for me, that macronutrient balance does not work for maintaining strength. Uh, specifically, I really I did need the quickly absorbed starch after my training sessions because there, there was just no way that I was going to be able to survive. And not only did I not hit my weight goal, like I said, my strength fell through the floor. So that's why this time I think I'm having a lot more success because I learned that, you know, I really actually do need a slightly higher carbohydrate consumption with the way that I train and the way my body is. And it's something that we encourage our clients to do. You know, like you're saying, at the end of the day, you are an individual person. There is no perfect balance prescription that you can write for everyone. You've got to be able to play around with it a little bit. But the principles still remain. Right. Yeah. Protein in general is good. Fat in general is good. Carbohydrates, it's super easy to overdo. So yeah. after your workout, why, why, why did you pick rice as opposed to maybe like a sweet potato option? So personally, I, I really don't like sweet potatoes all that much. I'll be perfect. <laughs> <with that. laughs> um, rice, Chinese, I grew up with rice. I will want rice with every meal till the day that I die. So in a way, it's a way – I really am fundamentally a live-to-eat person. I love food. I love meals, and I love everything that goes with the meal, you know, the hanging out with the family and friends and whatnot. So rice for me is kind of a way to maybe emotionally satisfy that part of the component. Okay. From a biochemical standpoint, you know, my understanding of rice versus, say, gluten – Bread, you yeah. know, two easy examples to contrast. Rice in general is cleaner than bread is going to be, or yeah. by extension, pasta. So, you know, it's it's a necessary evil for me, but let's keep it relatively clean. And I think rice is a good good way to do that. Well, well for, and I talk about that, yeah. um, and you, people have to realize that too. And I'm one. Of the, I remember when I first started talking about this a couple of years ago, is the ethnic diversity in diet. People get real goofy when you start talking about ethnicity they instantly think you're going into some taboos or something and it's like no but for diet you have to understand that you know you're going to have there's a good chance you're going to have enzymatically different reactions within your body to rice than i'm going to have no doubt that's just the a fact of life and people think you're getting into some you know like i said some touchy issues and it's like no you have to understand that you know, that you, you, you're ethnically, you spent tens of thousands of, you know, of years, if not hundreds of thousands of years, adapting to a certain food. Right. What we're doing is we're giving a template. Paleo is basically giving you basic rules. And people think we hammer on people for, you know, rice isn't paleo and, and you know, legumes aren't paleo. And I go, yes, but here's the thing. We're not telling the average person to go out and eat it every day who doesn't have the ethnicity or the background, you know, right. metabolically You're, to be able to handle those foods. And right. that's what his, his enzymes might be way better in terms of his body being able to metabolize that than others. Yeah. But and we have to also say that rice isn't paleo. And if you're going to include rice in your diet, that's cool. It can be a subcomponent of your paleo diet, but don't call it paleo. And that's one of the things. Exactly. That's one of the issues that yeah. we're having right now is a lot of people are trying to add stuff in that isn't paleo. It wasn't part of that original human diet that Dr. Lauren Cordain, you know, studied. And that's fine. It works for you. You can also do sweet potato and still 
take in those carbs and be paleo. It's just your personal choice. You found that worked well for you. For me, like after I work out, I'll go have a burger, a lettuce like wrap burger or paleo wrap and throw some chicken in there and have some fiber and I'm good for me and that I'm still able to keep my strength levels up. That might not be for everybody. Um, and you know, it's something that I'm, I'm playing around with myself, but, but it is definitely important to clarify that rice is a grain. It's not part of paleo, yes. but it, it does work. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, and Heath, you know, you, you raise a good, you raise a good point. And I think maybe you, with language, for example, we tend to default to the easy and the lazy, right? So when, yeah. when I say paleo, for example, Alessandra and I, we, we eat a paleo, we follow a paleo or a primal lifestyle. Really, that's a shorthand version of saying in general, yeah. <laughs> so I stick to the principles of, yeah. but yes, you know, to, if I was asked to be very specific, yeah, I would be the first to admit we do not, by the technical version, meet the definition of a true paleo diet because there are components like rice or something like that in there. Um, I think as long as most people, you know, they, they understand the principles of what we're trying, what we're all trying to do, that that's the main thing. So, yeah, yeah but I, I also, that's what, that's a pet peeve of mine. Someone's <laughs> like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm paleo. It's like, well, okay, not really. And you know, you've yeah. got all these paleo cupcakes and paleo this and paleo that. Half your meals are a paleo version of a dessert. You're, you are straying from the philosophy of yep. what we are trying to do, which is not eat sugar at every meal. So <laughs> it's, yes, it's, 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 a, it's a real problem right now because, you know, you have people saying rice or potatoes are okay on, on paleo. And then it's like people overindulge all of a sudden. And it, so what Gary and I have tried to do is like, hey, follow a low carb, low sugar approach. If you are going to take in carbs, have it right after you, you work out. And working out is one of those key words in that whole sentence right there. Because a lot of people are just doing paleo and they're not working out. And it's like, hey, this isn't working for me. You know, and it, it is a very important part. But it's, it's important to put, you know, rice and potatoes in their own category. And uh, because paleo in and of itself, if you're very strict, will work. And, and, it, and it's okay to play around with other templates or other, you know, things that work for you, but don't call them paleo. So Yeah, well, and you'll see right here, I think it's a good example of we just gave three very different meals that we eat to me. I usually eat, you know, after working out, I'll eat a, a big salad. You know, it's got a lot of, uh, you know, I usually, I like arugula. That's my favorite, dark leafy green. Um, you know, I throw in some protein, usually chicken, um, you know, fish, and I'll have like cucumbers. I'll have some carrots, you know, avocado, and that's my meal. But that's far different than your guys' meal when you think about it as a post-workout meal. But it works for me. Yours works for you. And that's where I think people get hung up too. They want you to give them the specific exact meal answer. And it's like, it's just different. I mean, it just depends and it changes. You being a doctor, heck, you know this, that our bodies are, it's ebb and flow all the time. Things are shifting, things are moving. You know, I may have a better carb, you know, uh, tolerance at a certain time of the year or a certain time of the day, as opposed to a different part. You know, and that's why I tell people, you have to understand the basics and fundamentals First, get that, use that basic template, then try and spread it out and figure out what works for you instead of saying, oh, you know what, I'm going to make it my personal template. I'm just going to do whatever the heck I want. I'm going to eat rice anyway. I'll eat this treat. Yeah, I'm going to eat peas. I'm going to eat this. And then after a while you go, then they come back to you. They go, my joints hurt. It didn't work and I gained weight. And that's the problem in the movement right now is people are placating to other people to make it easy when we know that any change is hard. Right. Yeah. You Agreed. know, it's just, I think there's a lot, a lot of dishonesty in the sense that people are more concerned about selling something than actually helping people. Right. Potentially, you know, obviously you're always going to have those elements that have that kind of disingenuous yeah. side to things. And you know, that that's going to be human nature. Anything. What I would say is you, you, you kind of made me think of a little side branch, uh, a difficulty of, you know, something that you guys, face right anyone that is really trying to help other people and help them out with a dietary or a lifestyle modification that difficulty is i think people just fundamentally are lazy honestly yeah. like i have absolutely <laughs> yeah I have kind of dim view of you know your average person's level of motivation and it's not even really a judgment attached to it it's just it is what it is so for those people they are going to look for the easy answer 
they're going to look for that template or that prescription. And if you're not giving, like, for example, your answer, Heath's answer is much more nuanced, right? And if you think about it, it really is the only real answer that there is. The answer is it depends. You're an individual. Let's work with this. Let's take the data and constantly titrate and figure out what works for you. They don't want to hear that. They want that prescription. If A, then B, follow this, and in 30 days you're going to look, you know, like this other person. If you don't give them that, man, it's an uphill battle. So, you know, yeah. kudos to you guys. It's, it's well, tough. our, our I, problem is our brutal honesty, I guess, is the way, and that's just the way I'm wired. You know, I just don't have a BS ability in me, and people get that. I, I, you ask me a question, you're going to get an answer. You may not like the answer at all, but you're going to. I'm not going to candy coat it. I just, you know, and. I tell people who hit me up in emails and they give me these long-winded questions and they start battling me on, you know, battling me on what I'm trying to tell them. And then they finally, like I just had this happen, the guy emails me and goes, oh, yeah, and by the way, I've gained 50, 60 pounds and I'm overweight. Yep. And he's fighting me on my principles that I'm trying to help him with. And he's telling me my information's wrong and what I'm teaching's wrong. And then finally he admits, oh, yeah, I'm following this. And it doesn't work, and I'm overweight now. And, and I'm and not exercising. Like, oh, oh, yeah. no. And he wasn't exercising. <laughs> exactly. I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what. I mean, I will confess, outside of my gym members and maybe some very close family or friends, maybe a colleague at work that I know is very interested, when people ask me for dietary advice, I don't answer them. What, my, what I say to them is, Do you, are you really asking because you want to know? Or are you asking to argue slash yeah, maybe look for a good point. of your own processes? Because it's exactly as you described. I, I've lost track of the number of people who quote unquote ask me a question about diet. And the instant I start to answer, it's argument this, but what about that? You know, but I thought that, and so then I just stop. I'm like, you know what? I actually don't have the mental energy for this. I kind of was happily going about my day. I don't want to argue. If you, you believe whatever it is you want to believe. But if yeah. it's a question, I'll answer it. If it's just an argument waiting to happen, I, I don't do it anymore. So, you know, I owe my gym members my time. Well, and that's why I wrote my book, to be honest with you. Uh, that was primarily the reason is I was always getting hit up for advice. And I always did it. I did a lot of it for free, you know, and I was in a transition from the government, figuring out what I wanted to do. And I, that's why I said, you know, I went, I got this information. Let me put it in books. You know, make it simple and easy. And people would look at that and they go, oh, you're just trying to sell me something. And I'm all, no, I wrote these books for you, not me, so I can give them to you so you can read it. And then you can come back to me with questions. And if you want to battle me on the facts in the book, fine. I back all my stuff up. It's all backed up in the books. I have all my references. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and but they don't want that yet again because that takes effort. They've exactly. got to actually take that step instead of coming to me, asking me a question, then punching me in the face, saying you're wrong. And I think people have gotten combative too, is they want help, but they're not real sure how to ask. And now they've become so defensive because I think uh, in the health and wellness world, we've been all been hammered over the head with such bad information in the next you know, six pack abs video and piece of equipment made out of whatever. You know, that I think people are so skeptical, it makes it just a constant battle. Right. You know? To a certain extent, exactly. They're, by us asking people to change or talking about how the old way was wrong, in a way, we're kind of invalidating and making a judgment, a negative judgment, right, on yeah. how they used to live, how they still do live, right? And, of course, a lot of people are going to take that personally and emotionally. Yeah. I, I think all of us, you guys for sure, no doubt can tell the difference between an honest to God question about the data where they say, well, you know, I'm, I'm curious about that. Can you tell me more? Explain to me what that data means versus your, I just want to argue. You know, it's easy to see one versus the other coming at least. Well, yeah, it is. I'm getting better at it. I guess I'm, people think I'm a real jerk, but I'm actually a really nice guy, you know, I'm pretty easy going, and uh, I think uh, they take advantage a little bit of that, and they kind of they're kind of worming their way in, and then then I'm all, uh oh, you know, I'm three three emails deep in this thing, and you catch it, you go, oh, right, I, you know, they totally d duped me into this exactly. argument that I didn't want to have. <laughs> I think if people can just realize that Gary and I are trying to take all the information that's currently available 
and give it to people in a way that it's easy to follow. We've, yeah. We found that a paleo ketogenic uh, template or a way of eating is the easiest way to lose weight and get have great success in the gym and that you end up burning fat as energy and and you know as you lose your fat your hormone levels are going to start increasing your testosterone is going to you know start going up your estrogen levels are going to start to dip and you're going to start seeing you know what's underneath that layer of fat if you have it or you're going to be able to maintain your weight and it's it's really easy and and people fight us on a paleo ketogenic diet and it's the cleanest possible diet you can have you know, and you know something like you you brought to my attention today, and I actually want to try it is maybe start adding in some sweet potatoes after my workout and see if I have any issues with sustained energy. Because I was always curious if I work out really hard and I add some sweet potatoes in after my workout, am I going to have any issues with blood sugar later on in the day? Have you have you noticed anything after consuming rice? No, honestly. Um... And like I said, I mean, I only know what it was like before when that rice component was not there. Right. There, I would definitely bunk, okay. you know, and my, my strength levels went down. You know, and like as much as we've been talking about the, individ the need for individualization when you want to get someone there 100%, I mean, you're right. Simply giving someone the paleo ketogenic principles should get most of the people 90% of the way there. Yeah, that's absolutely that yeah. goddamn good yeah. enough for me. For, <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, it's a big difference from where they were before, and that's right. why I tell them. And, and that's the thing; it's uh, that strive, I guess, for perfection. Everyone's trying to go from basically a sloth that's a mess to this perfect athlete because we've been just inundated with, you know, sports stars, models, and this is how you're supposed to look. If and it's just, it's trying. There's so many dynamics going on in the battle yeah. that I tell them just, just take a step back, remove yourself from all that follow it, see what happens, and kind of turn down the noise. You know, don't get, what, a big mistake I notice people do too is they come to me or Heath and we give them the basic template and they, instead of just following it, they dabble. They start reaching out for other things. They go, oh, wait, I'm going to go, you know, low carb, high fat. I'm going to do that in the middle of it. And, and I always tell them, no, just focus. Just stick with this for at least 30 days. Let your body adjust somewhat, and I think we're all that way. We tinker, and we don't know when to stop. And instead of just focusing on one principle and going with it, and I always tell people, don't do that. Just stick with the program for 30, 60 days, then try and start dabbling. And even then, I don't recommend a whole lot of it. And, and the, the irony yeah. there is, like, like we just said, the vast majority of people are really looking for a template, something that they can follow cookie cutter step by step, but then when you give that to them, they want they to follow it anyway. Uh, <laughs> yeah, they don't follow it. And you're all like, yeah, and I've done it. Hey, I'm not saying I'm not saying this at all. Like, I'm perfect. I learned the lesson from doing it myself. And the lesson I learned was I screwed my body up big time. And I threw I took myself backwards. You know, I got going in the right direction and I started experimenting with something else. And I, I spent probably a year trying to unscrew everything I did because I couldn't figure out what exactly I did because I wholesale switched over and then I'm all, oh no, what? I changed so many things. I had to keep picking pieces back out, trying right. to figure it out, take this one out, is that it? And what I ended up doing is I ended up falling right back into paleo, which I didn't know I was doing paleo in the beginning because paleo really wasn't well known. And then I went back actually into the paleo template and boom, all the stuff I'd screwed up kind of found itself again. I got back to my, you know, my homeostasis point where I start feeling good again. Yeah. I was like, God, what an idiot. Why am I so stupid? Yeah. You know, so not to think that, you know, I'm just out there bashing people that this is, I've done it. Trust me, I've done probably far stupider things than any of them have done. Sure. But I've paid the price and that's what I'm trying to save them to is a ton of time. Exactly. And I mean, if anything, also now you have that experience to draw from, right? We have that experience yeah. to draw from. I would have give the advice to someone if they wanted to tinker. Okay, but keep it truly one variable at a time. Exactly. Right? So you kind of, again, it's data driven. You kind of know exactly what the change was. And if it wasn't something that you want, 
you know what you need to take out, right? So, yep. you know, that even that experience is helpful. Do, Dr. Chain, have you, um, yeah, you, we all actually probably are on the same page here. Gary and I talk about this a lot, where when you're first starting off, you know, you do, you, you have that sense of laziness. You don't, you don't have any drive. You don't have any passion to go out and like tackle, you know, losing the weight. And I oftentimes found that's usually uh, revolves around your hormones are, are off. And is there anything you can take in terms of supplements that you found that, that can help kind of put that, that drive back in, you know, your life, and especially when you're first starting off? Obviously, adjusting the diet, you're going to feel better, you know, right away. But have you found any sort of supplements or any sort of clinical studies maybe? I found like Tonkat Ali, for instance, boosts okay. natural testosterone, uh, and there's a bunch of government studies to back that. Have you found anything to kind of help, you know, maybe it's a pre-workout drink that's really clean or, or uh, you know, alpha ketoglutarate or anything? Sure. So, yeah, honestly, not really, and I'll confess, I don't know all that much about about supplements. So, for example, I'm, I'm a big fan of fish oil. You know, I think fish oil is definitely one of those things, right? We know there's there's proven benefit and the vast majority of us do not get enough, you know, omega-3s and or fish consumption in, in our daily life. Uh, so I don't even know if fish oil should be considered a supplement at that point. Sure. Yeah. Um, and the only other supplements that I really know of are much more from the weightlifting slash strength building community okay. as opposed to a general wellness type supplement. So for example, creatine. Uh, I feel like I know creatine pretty well. It probably doesn't do anything for the vast majority of people, but it doesn't hurt them. So I always tell people, hey, you know what, if you want to, go ahead. You know, it, it's not going to hurt you. Everything else, you know, the, the supplements that kind of come more from that side, I am in general very wary. Because I sit there and I'm like, at the end of the day, this is a product, right? And yeah. talking about a product that is unnatural in some way, someone is making it and they are selling it to you. And if it really were that effective, again, this is more from the strength building communities. If it really were that effective, it would be banned. Yeah. Have yeah. A full list of banned. <laughs> and the yeah. a great banned point. <laughs> because they work. Now, to address your question, I'll, I'll confess, I just, I really don't know much at all to be able to intelligently comment about as far as like hormonal modulation or fluctuation. So That's totally yeah. fine. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah. um, it's just something that we're coming across a lot because people have gained the weight. Their estrogen levels are usually through the roof. You see a lot of guys with gynecomastia or um, just really, you know, carrying all their weight in their stomachs, you know, and we really try to preach to people, hey, start cleansing, change your diet. You know, uh, do some research on just really clean herbs like, you know, like I was saying, Tonkat Ali or there's herbs to reduce estrogen like indol 3 carbonyl or up your broccoli to reduce estrogen. You're going to start feeling better. You're going to feel that drive come back. Um, and uh, because you're right, it's just so many people are so lazy and it's not necessarily their fault. It's just because their, their body is out of whack. You know? Yeah, they're sick. The organism is sick. Yeah. You know, and it's trying to conserve energy, you know. Um, that's the problem, you know, and in the medical community, since you are, and you're an MD, not an ND, so you're in the mainstream Western medicine. Right. How is that, how is that affected as far as what you do? Because you're kind of, and I'm a firm believer, I'm one of the oddballs in this genre, in this group. Mm -hmm. I firmly believe in Western medicine balanced with naturopathic medicine. I believe in both. I say right. there's, there's a balance with the two. Everyone else wants to cut out modern medicine and just say it's garbage in our movement. I'm all, whoa, you know, I don't want, you know, I don't, I don't want a, a nutritional practitioner doing my back surgery or my brain surgery, okay? You know, so have you found that in your community as far as what you do? Is there a, a shift or a change and how have you had to deal with it? People know what you do at work? In traditional medicine, so that, that's a, it's a big question. Yeah. Uh, the, my own little community in my department and my immediate colleagues, for example, I'd say there may have been a small shift simply by virtue of them essentially being exposed to me for, you know, four or five years. And some enlightened folks, let's call them, may have started to subtly realize, you know what, diet may actually play a larger role than traditionally we give it credit for. Yeah. The USDA food pyramid very well may be wrong. But unfortunately, I think within modern Western medicine as a whole, 
the community is very slow to embrace and, if anything, is actively resistant to a lot of the stuff that we're doing. And, and we, we know why, right? Because at the end of the day, it invalidates everything that they were taught in medical school or they were taught about how to prescribe a diet. You know, a complaint that I think is valid that a lot of people tend to make about doctors is, you know, a lot of us have a God complex, right? We think we know everything. We're the guys with the answers, right? The fact of the matter is nutrition in medical school is essentially non-existent as a teaching. You know, we might have one or two lectures on it over four years. Wow. That's no way. I mean, you can do an internet search and pretty much learn as much as your average physician learns about diet during their entire training. But we are taught to kind of carry ourselves as the expert in all things having to do with the body, and it doesn't matter what that happens to be. So then when you approach a physician and you say, look, everything you know is wrong, and oh, by the way, the information they fed you in medical school, that was influenced by the government and bought out by some lobbyist with a politician, and there you have it. You don't actually know anything. In fact, what you know is worse than nothing. Clearly, they're going to be resistant to that, right? Yeah. And those are the guys that they control the studies. They, a physician with a lab can decide whether he wants to run a low-fat versus high-fat diet study. He can decide how he analyzes the data, right? We know data is, uh, it will always be biased if the person looking at the data has an agenda. You, you can find your answer in any data set if you're looking for an answer ahead of time with an agenda. That's a dangerous spot to be in. I mean, it's, it's kind of tough. And again, you know, I, I in no way am invalidating Western medicine either, right, Gary? I mean, I think my opinion is basically the same as yours. Yeah. You know, like at the end of the day, you have an appendix that needs to come out, you need a surgeon. You know, any number of natural natural remedies for that probably aren't, is not going to work. But It'll work, yeah. You can't unrupture an appendix. <laughs> you, need, you, know. you need to understand the limitations of Western medicine. One of the limitations is dogmatic thinking, the same sort of data-driven evidence that we crave, which makes it so when we have the data, where we know we're standing on solid ground makes us very resistant to change because now you're like, well, now I'm not going to change until you show me data, right? And like we said at the beginning of, of this interview, it, it can be hard, especially with something as multifactorial as diet and lifestyle. So Yeah. Well, yeah, there's so many things going on. But I just thought that was an interesting to see because we've had a couple doctors on and uh, it, it's always interesting to see that the ones who are immersed, uh, you're the first real MD as far as the Western side that we've had on, right? Heath, I don't think we've had anyone on yet. And and it's it's a dilemma. I mean, I talked to doctors. We've talked, Leon, before, and it it's tough. I mean, you got to be careful, too, with what you say. Right. You know, you don't want to alienate yourself from your community that you're in. Um, so it's always, yeah, it's this whole balance. But I just tell people, you are your best doctor. You need to learn it on your own. Don't rely on you to go there when you're broken and go, I don't know. Right. What have you been doing? I don't know. What have you been eating? I don't know. Do you exercise? Eh. You know, and that's, it's like, how can you expect a doctor to help you in that circumstance either? Right. You have to take responsibility for your own body. So when I walk into a doctor, they love me and hate me because they know I've already kind of got my diagnostics done. <laughs> I already know everything that's going on and I lay it out to them when it started what happened what are my symptoms you know and they're, they're like oh okay that makes it a lot easier instead of walking in and go fix me right yeah I, I completely agree I mean so my field is anesthesiology for example right which is probably the furthest thing removed from primary care <laughs> and I, I picked anesthesia for a reason I love it uh, that being said, you know, if I were a primary care doctor, for example, I would, I would love a patient like you because you're, you're educated enough, you've done your background homework where we don't need to spend the majority of the visit kind of going over that stuff. But at the same time, I am not looking for a drone, right? I am not looking to give someone, you know, okay, well, here, this is what you do, see you six months from now, right? I want someone that will take charge of their own life, and I, I think that's part of the problem we have with Western society and our health in general. A yeah, lot of people yeah. just don't take control of their own lives and, and do stuff for themselves. So that's an episode for a whole nother time. Yeah. Maybe we'll have to talk about that, you know, just far as because me and you have talked about it. 
yeah. um, about that, you know, it's, it's, it's a multifaceted problem. I mean, you have huge industry involved, so there's massive amounts of money. I mean, massive amounts of money. I mean, we're, we're nearing $3 trillion a year in healthcare costs. Right. You know, and then you have a society that has kind of lost its way. You know, it's that, you know, just like the Romans, you know, you get fat, lazy, and comfortable, and then everything falls apart. Yep. Yeah, there's something, there's something to be said, you know, I mean, yeah. what what you're doing is, you know, you're, you're at Elysium, your you're CrossFit gym, um, yeah. I think it's awesome because you're, you're teaching people how to eat right. I'm assuming you give some nutritional courses or like you talk to them about their diet. Yeah, we've, we've done a few nutrition seminars in the past. You know, my wife is officially the nutrition and lifestyle coach awesome. for our gym. And, you know, we, and we always make ourselves available as a resource. Yeah, and then you're combining it with a, a great, I mean, what a better, there's no better way to work out. It's such a great, intense workout, CrossFit, and you're teaching how, people how to lift properly. And, and um, what's, uh, what's your domain? Where can people find you, um, Dr. Chang? So it's uh, the website is www. CrossFit Elysium, all one word, so that's C-R-O-S-S-F-I-T-E-L-Y-S-I-U-M.com. Awesome. Uh, and then, you know, all of our information is up on the website, and we have links to, for example, you know, my wife's, her, her business page and her personal coaching stuff as well. So. Oh, excellent. Yeah, I know. Um, it's And we'll, we'll make sure the links are up. Yep. We'll get all the links up. We'll put all the links in the description. We want to thank everybody for tuning in today, and thank you for coming on the show. Um, we really appreciate having you on. and, and You're welcome. Kind of My pleasure. On this and um, we'll, uh, we'll talk to everybody soon. Make sure you hit the subscribe button. Um, you'll get notifications on all of our new videos. And if you have any questions for us, email Gary at Gary at theprimalshow.com or myself, Heath, at theprimalshow.com. Thank you all for tuning in, and uh, we'll talk to you soon, Dr. Chang. Sounds good. Thanks, guys. Bye.